Podcasting from a secret location, deep inside the political colossus. This is Radio Free GOP, the voice of the Republican resistance. Part of the beauty of me is that I'm very rich. Let me tell you, I'm a really smart guy. What's your name again? John Miller. Oh my God, they've got a madman on their hands. We will have no truth nor folly with you or the grisly gang who work your wicked will. You do your work and we will do our best. <laughs> We've come to a turning point, a moment for hard decisions. If not us, who? And if not now, when? It's 1159 at Radio Free America, and this is Uncle Sam with music and the truth until dawn. Right now, I got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. This is Radio Free GOP with your host, Mike Murphy. Polapalooza. We've got polls everywhere, and we're going to look at them, analyze them, see what they mean here after both conventions when the race has really begun. And then political feuds. We've had legendary ones, Hatfield, McCoy, Clinton, Gore, Pat Cadell versus everybody. And I have to say, in the political consultant world, there's been a famous feud between yours truly and Stuart Stevens, the Stevens-Murphy feud. Well, (laughs) this is going to be the talk of D.C. You can't underestimate the power of the orange menace to unite people against evil. So today... On the interview at the end of the podcast, we have the one, the only, Stuart Stevens. He used to have a big career, but now he's had enough. Podcasting's like therapy, he shrinks as it's raised up. Radio Free GOP. Polls, 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 polls to the right, polls to the left. We're surrounded by polls. Why? Well, we just had the first big event of the campaign, the two conventions. The country got to hear from each party what they're thinking about. We've got the orange Batman on one side with his dark Gotham City view, and we've got the Democrats cribbing from the Ronald Reagan script of optimism. Talk about an election that's totally upside down. So let's read them and weep here for Donald because the polls are not very good. NBC, Wall Street Journal, Trump down nine. The Marist poll with the McClatchy newspaper sponsoring it, Trump down 15. Fox News, not exactly a liberal front group, Trump down 10. And the best one for Trump, Reuters in the latest poll has Trump down only four, just about the margin of error. So not so good. But oh, you hear the line that would only really counts are the polls in the swing states. That's actually not true. The national polls correlate to what's happening in the swing states. But let's take a look at a few. They're not all back. We don't have anything from Virginia, where Tim Kaine was probably helpful. And we don't have anything from Ohio, arguably the most important state and one where Trump had been doing fairly well compared to other places. Those will probably be out soon. Florida, latest poll has Trump down six. Pennsylvania, not really a swing state, but a state that Trump wants to pick up and has made a big effort in, down 11. New Hampshire, a state that Trump won in the primary and that he brags about quite a bit. The WBUR poll, not my favorite, but, you know, legitimate, has Trump down, get this, 17 points. Only North Carolina with Trump plus four shows any good news. These polls, if you take them together, paint a pretty rough picture for Donald Trump. Let's dive into this a little bit. Here's some brand new polling, though it's too soon. First of all, should we even believe polls? There's so much focus on them. I often joke that if I were in the fun job of being head of Red Chinese Intelligence, I'd spend a lot of money bribing media pollsters because the national media dialogue totally follows what the polling says. Well, the closer you get to an election, the more accurate polls are. And after a big event like the conventions, as I mentioned, the polls do measure what's happening now. Now, there's no doubt that Hillary Clinton had a convention bounce. Some of that will melt away. I think the race will tighten a little. But if you look into the cross tabs, the numbers inside the numbers of these polls, you see a lot of trouble for Donald Trump. In the contest between the Trump message of Gotham City looking for an orange Batman versus the Clinton Democratic message of a wider, more accepting national community, the American ideal of us all coming together in our democracy rather than a single super leader, No question that the Democrats carried the day with their messaging. So let's dig in a little bit and see, even with all the caveats about polling, what the internal numbers tell us. 
I'm going to use the NBC Wall Street Journal poll, which is conducted by two reputable polling firms, Peter Hart and Associates on the Democratic side and Public Opinion Strategies on the Republican side. So you can be pretty confident it is a poll with high technical competence. The overall ballot, well, Clinton Kane 47, Trump Pence 38. That's it, nine points. Not a rosy number. Notice that Trump is under 40, while Hillary is at striking distance of 50. Because of the third-party candidates who are polling a little higher this year than normal, we have yet to see how that stew will turn out. Um, the winning number could be 46, 47, 48. So Hillary, if this poll sticks, is pretty much where she needs to be. And, of course, Trump is under 40. A bag of cement with an R on it can get 37 and a half. So he's at the bottom of the bottom. Now, into those cross tabs, let's see how the different groups in the poll are responding. Among men, traditionally Trump's base, this is all men, by the way, including minority men, Trump is behind by one point before he had been ahead. Among women, well, Donald Trump is the new Bobby Riggs. There's an old reference for <laughs> you fellow old people. Bobby Riggs was the famous tennis hustler who played Billie Jean King and lost in one of the great hype tennis matches of yore. Anyway, that's old guy code for women hate Trump. Here's the number. 51 Hillary, 35 for Trump. That is a huge deficit. Now, a lot of commentators have made the point, and they're completely correct. Ron Bronstein at the National Journal in particular has been very dead on right about all this, that you have to look at this thing by the quadrants of the election. In other words, Caucasian men and women and minority men and women, because you get different numbers. Among the non-white voters in this poll, Hillary Clinton is 52 points ahead, 69 to 17. What's interesting about that is there's a big hunk of undecided, and I doubt much of that undecided minority vote is going to break to Donald Trump. He's way under the territory that Romney was in when he lost by a pretty large number. So if Donald Trump thinks that minority voters are going to be better for him than the already troubled Republican norm, I think he's in for a pretty lousy surprise. In fact, in this NBC Wall Street Journal poll, the African-American vote is voting 91% Clinton and 1% for Trump. Now, that's interesting because the margin of error on the poll is about four points. So statistically, we can't prove that any African-American supporters of Donald Trump even exist. Now, there will be turbulence in these numbers. Again, we're looking at a little Hillary bump. Donald might be able to get up to the traditional 8 or 9% of the African-American vote. But Don King or not, that's not where the answer is. Now, let's look at the white voters because this is pretty interesting. Among all white voters, Trump is winning by five points. 40 for Clinton, 45 for Trump. But he's got to do almost five times better than that to win the election. And if you take a look at the other big cut in the data, it's whether or not you went to college. Trump's strongest group has been non-college men, followed by non-college women. Among all non-college voters in this data, Trump is ahead by about 13 points. He's at 49. It's the only good number for Trump in the polling here. And she's at 36. 13-point lead. Here's the problem. 13 points isn't enough when you're getting slaughtered by the 30% of the vote that are going to be minority, either black, Latino, mixed race, or Asian. Interestingly, when you go to college-educated voters, Hillary Clinton is leading Donald Trump by seven points, 47 to 40. Now, that is a huge, huge number and a huge problem for Donald Trump. Our Republican side has never had a national candidate, even in losing elections, not carry the white college-educated vote. So she is seven points into our territory, a group that Trump needs to win by big double digits to even have a prayer of making it in the White House. So the bottom line, Trump is surrounded here. He's on a demographic island. He's got white voters, but by a small margin, not nearly enough to overcome Hillary's lead with minority voters. Men are tied where he should be way ahead, and he's getting slaughtered with women, particularly college-educated women, though he's now losing all college-educated white voters, the very base he needs a wipeout win with to be a viable candidate and actually win the presidency. This polling is a flatline EKG, and it means curtains for Donald Trump unless something big changes. Now, again, we got over 90 days here. We have debates. A lot can happen in a presidential campaign. But this is about as bad as it gets. It'll be interesting to see if Trump can get out of the quagmire he's in right now.
There are signs they're trying in the Trump campaign. They're trying to give the media the narrative of a change. Trump read from prepared remarks today on Friday. He's trying to put the onus back on Hillary Clinton by attacking her veracity and her trustworthiness. It's interesting. This is a campaign where both candidates are unpopular enough that when we're talking about Trump, he's losing. When we talk about Hillary Clinton, she starts to lose. So the Trump campaign is trying to push the debate back to Hillary Clinton. The problem is Trump is like Velcro for trouble. Almost every day he says something that's offensive or convinces people he's not ready or prepared by temperament or experience to be commander in chief. So he's the kid who keeps sticking his finger in the electric socket no matter what you tell him to do. And he's uh, he's getting the trouble that comes with that kind of behavior. Can Trump change it up? I'm dubious. He's Trump. How do you fix that sort of irrational personality that can't resist saying provocative things? It worked in the primary, but it is a poison cocktail in the general election because the demography is different. The voters in the general election are not the same as the primary. And Trump is, in many ways now, a fish out of water gasping for political air. So my prediction, Trump will do a little better. The polling will close. I don't think we're looking at a 10-point race here, though, you know, it could happen. So I think we'll see things tighten a bit. But I doubt we'll see, in an average of credible polls, Donald Trump back in the lead for the rest of this campaign. Because for that to happen, he needs something to occur that we have not seen in American politics. He needs a huge group of voters, whether it's college-educated voters, particularly college-educated white women, or minority voters, to dramatically change what they think about him. And in the history of these things, that has always been a bit of a bridge too far. Okay, let's do some commerce. Mike Murphy, podcast insanity, radio free, GOP. Well, we did it. The Titans of Madison Avenue are coming to us, and we're starting to gain advertisers. And our first kickoff extra special sponsor is the Private Equity Fundcast. Let me tell you about these guys. It's interesting. The Private Equity Fundcast is a weekly podcast hosted by the expert Jim Milbury and Devin Matthews. They're partners in a Chicago-based private equity firm. Devin and Jim have spent the better part of the last 15 years buying and managing mid-market technology companies. The Funcast draws from their collective experience to pull back the veil on private equity, like we do here on Radio Free GOP about politics, tell you what's really going on from a professional point of view. These guys talk about everything from the seven deadly sins of private equity to the good, the bad, and the ugly of board meetings. If you're a founder or owner of a business, if you work in management for a private equity-backed company, provide services to private companies as perhaps an investment banker, lawyer, or accountant, or you just like to geek out on private equity, and I'll confess that I do, you should subscribe to the Private Equity Funcast on iTunes or Google Play. One more time, that is the Private Equity Funcast on iTunes or Google Play. Get smart, hear from real experts. I also want to thank Ricochet.com. They partially sponsor us. They can't afford the real tab, but they're good guys. The smartest and most civil center-right community on the web. They guarantee no trolling. You can become a member. You can let your voice be heard and listen to tons of great podcasts like this one, all for just five bucks a month. And if you're a Radio Free GOP listener, you get the first month free. Just go to ricochet.com slash join. That's ricochet.com slash join, and you can get in business with Ricochet right away. Now, last thing, t-shirts. They are going fast, I'm telling you. We have a fashion sensation. Our cool logo of the Jack Frost elephant logo, upside down in distress. They come in Go to the Opera Blue or Rebellious White with the groovy logo. They're American-made. None of this cheap Trump merchandise here. This is the real thing made by American workers. You can get them on our website at www.radiofreegop.com. You can also go to that website and click the little Amazon button. So when you buy merch on Amazon, say you need a snowmobile, something exciting. Expensive. Well, you just click that button, you pay the same price, but we get our beak wet here. We get a little taste, a little something to pay the electric bill and keep the various yes men and hench people and audio engineers and jingle singers we employ well fed. So you can help us out through Amazon or if you're as cheap as the Ricochet guys, you can give 99 cents or a buck 99 on PayPal to pay our enormous electric bill. We appreciate all of it and thank you for listening. Sanity. Sanity in this crazy year on Radio Free GOP. I like to teach 
touch the world to sing, sing with me. Can Donald Trump actually bring people together? Well, you might be surprised by this. Nothing entertains the consultant community or the Washington, D.C. journalism community around politics like a good consultant feud. There have been many epic ones. They're almost always between people in the same party. And one of the more epic ones has been between myself and fellow Republican consultant Stuart Stevens. We have not gotten along. There have been snarky tweets, snarky newspaper quotes, snarky unquoted sources in newspapers. We've been kind of scrapping for more than 20 years. I can barely remember how it even started, but I'm Irish and I live for my grudges, so thing kind of took over a life of its own. Well, nothing like an orange plague to create an existential threat to a party that I and Stuart both believe in to bring warring factions together. Yep, Trump did it. Trump brought Murphy and Stevens together in the common cause of worrying about what this fraud is doing to our party. As I was ranting and raving about Trump, I couldn't help but notice Stewart doing the same thing. It appeared, shock of all shocks, that we actually agreed on something. Well, this led to a few amicable phone calls, a couple of good chats, and I eventually invited Stewart to come on the podcast for an interview, and he graciously accepted. Here it is on Radio Free GOP. We are here with the podcast interview that nobody would have thought would happen. My guest is a highly accomplished Republican consultant, Stuart Stevens, and no real people care about this, but in the D.C. Beltway, there was famous mythology talk for over 20 years about the epic Hatfield, McCoy, Murphy, and Stevens feud, yet here he is, brought together Murphy and Stevens by one thing, the force that could break down all walls, the specter of the orange menace himself, Donald Trump, as president of the United States. <laughs> Stuart, thank you for doing the podcast. Hey, listen, man, it's great to be here, and I'm glad something productive has come out of Donald Trump um, that uh, gives some solace to uh, late-night uh, worries about uh, where we're headed. It was a sobering thought, and you called me about some of the various Stop Trump stuff that I'm highly sympathetic to, and we had a good chat, and I think we both kind of thought— Feud schmood, we got a threat to the country now, and we're on the same side of this one. So it's, it's like a superhero movie. You know, we put it all aside, and the Trump cause has united us. Now, I'm not out renting a tandem bicycle yet, but it's uh, good to put the feud behind us. Do you remember when it even started? I have, this is embarrassing, but I can't. Was it the 90s? It was the 90s. You know, it may go back to this. Uh Pennsylvania governor's race. Oh, that's right. Ernie, Ernie Prie. Right. <laughs> and that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So somehow we got tangled up in a feud back then. The feuds are kind of comfortable and we stayed in it. And then, then we kind of patched things up for a while there. As you say, it's of interest to uh, a few people who mainly to eat popcorn and watch people uh, fight. I mean, I had a field day after the Romney campaign ba- blaming you for everything, and you responded in kind. So it was it was never that personal. It just kind of became a thing because we, frankly, didn't see each other a lot, and we'd carp a little, and then there were always people on both sides cheering us on. And then, then the California governor's race, I remember we kind of— we had a pretty good phone conversation because I was pitching this kind of dead ender idea about Steve Poisoner, Meg's primary opponent, getting out of the race. And then Poisoner took that offer as an attempt to intimidate him. I remember next thing you know, the FBI was getting a call. <laughs> and and that, was, that kind of flared it up again. After that, here we are. I'm glad uh, that there was a way to clear this up. Um, from the bottom of our heart, thank you, Donald Trump. Yeah, for, thank you for all you've done for America. But you've <laughs> you put Stuart Stevens and Mike Murphy on the same side having an amicable chat. So maybe he is a peacemaker. Maybe we send him to the Middle East. Well, enough about the feud. We're declared over in the interest of shutting down the orange menace and move on to the question I ask every uh, guest here on Radio Free GOP Podcast. How'd you get started in politics? How did you get pulled away from a path toward legitimate occupation and wind up doing this? I grew up in Mississippi during the um, the real Mississippi burning days when politics was incredibly important and dramatic. And my family was close to a wonderful man named William Winter. He was a Democrat, of course. Everybody pretty much was Democrats then. And he ran for governor as a moderate 
on race, or as the phrase always went, he was good on race. And I, I started working in his campaigns, you know, just like walking precincts and doing all that kind of stuff. He kept running and losing. I, finally, I quit working for him, and he was able to get elected governor. That, that really drew me into politics. And I've always been kind of interested in three things, politics, film, and writing. And I've tried to pursue those three interests uh, with, you know, um, mixed degrees of success throughout my life. What was your first big race after that? Did you, did you work with Arthur back when? I did a little work with Arthur. I was hired to work on the primary, believe it or not. I mean, this is ancient, ancient history, when he was running against Jacob Javits. That would be the D'Amato race, Javits D'Amato? Yeah. Oh, my yeah, goodness. It, it was yeah. very strange, though. I didn't really, I'm sure I didn't know what I was doing. And Arthur, you know, it, it didn't last. I, I, I ended up bailing out. I should put a footnote in just uh, for a second that we're talking about Arthur Finkelstein, who's kind of a legendary, slightly oddball pollster who had a lot of influence on many consultants, myself, uh, Alex Castellanos, and others. Kind of a recluse, so he's not well-known outside the political family, but Arthur is sort of a hurricane, and when he touches your life, you don't forget. Anyway, I'm sorry, Stuart. Go ahead. No, no, I always I found Arthur fascinating, like you're saying, and, and thought he was really brilliant. We encountered each other off and on on other things, um, but never really worked together. I went out on my own, you know, really early and, and started a firm, and uh Really, uh, you know, partner up with Rush Schrieffer, and we've been together and now built out the firm in a lot of ways. Um, we do non-political stuff as well. And What was the first big race that kind of broke you through? Was it Weldon, Massachusetts, or something before that? Uh, in 90, I did Weldon, Massachusetts. That was a great race. And also I did Dan Coates that year. You know, I did Connie Mack for Congress when Connie Mack ran. Oh, boy. Ran, well, actually, you know, I worked with Arthur on that, and that comes back to me. I remember that Arthur thought Connie Mack, who was a young banker then running for Congress, he set up a slogan, smart, tough, and ready for the job. We we're sitting around with Connie. I said, so like, why those three things? And he looked at Connie and goes, because those three things are not apparent. <laughs> you have to make it clear. <laughs> and Connie, Connie fell out of his chair laughing. He goes, I agree, smart, tough, ready for the job. It was a great A very moment, Arthur actually. moment, yeah. And then off you went to the races. Now, are you still doing campaigns? I've kind of extracted myself to the pure corporate life here. I came back for the Jeb Super PAC out of retirement, and uh, the voters of New Hampshire said, enough of you. Yeah, no, we're doing uh, – you know, the firm is now managed by a woman named Ashley O'Connor, who's been with us for a long term. But, yeah, we, we're doing uh, a lot of races. 2014, we did like five governor's races and ha had a great cycle. It was a great cycle to have a great cycle. But involved in Senate races now and other things. Uh, doing also some corporate stuff. I found that, as I'm sure you ran into, you know, in, in the Jeb world, that the technological advances in many ways have made this easier because, you know, you don't have to be in those edit rooms all the time. Anymore. Yeah. One thing we all have in common is the living on edit rooms and waking up at three in the morning on a Naga Hyde couch. And eating really bad food. Yeah, and incredibly bad takeout food. Speaking of incredibly bad, how's this for clunky transitions? We're in the year of Trump, and we are both Trump dislikers. That's what, again, brought us together here in this uh, conversation. So, what do we think? The Trump phenomenon, where do we think it came from? I think that Trump speaks to a lot of uh, the darkness that is in our politics. I think it's in both parties, but I think it's been more prevalent in the Republican Party. He's a grievance monger. He's anti-Reagan. Reagan was going to lift us up. Donald Trump is, you know, whatever it is in your life that didn't quite happen the way you wanted to, whatever score you need settled, you know, he's going to go out in the dark alley and settle it for you. Yeah, I say he's the king of every pissed off shoe salesman in America who doesn't like that Martinez kid who gets in early and goes home late. He's just sent that cord. And, you know, I think that there is a large racial element, racial in a larger sense, not just against African Americans, but against other religions and otherness sense that he appeals to. And I think one of the greatest regrettable things about Trump is that he is made quasi-acceptable that which as a civil society we had decided was not acceptable under the guise that, well, we can't be politically correct. Racism is not a question of political correctness. It's a question of right and wrong. And I think Trump has played to that in a way that, you know, no one, and I'm from Mississippi, I'm a seventh generation Mississippian, no one in Mississippi today has any credibility remotely plays to those kind of chords that Trump is playing to. Yeah, it is a new shtick, but not really new. And I don't think he gets called out on it nearly enough. It occurred to me when we were driving over here, Trump is like a neutron bomb that has gone off in the Republican Party and is 
destroying anybody near him while leaving the structure intact. And Assuming the polling is correct as I do and the odds of Trump actually winning are really, really small, at the end, I think the party will survive it. We'll be in the same hole we've been in for a while. We just have to dig deeper to get out of it. I think he'll be like Dukakis 1989, quickly forgotten. I hope so anyway. Well, the danger, I, you know, the biggest change, I think, Mike, if you look at before 64, Republicans routinely got 30, 35 percent of African-American vote. Not great, but if you're 35, maybe you can see 40, get to 40, maybe see 45. And then it just fell off a cliff. So these latest numbers, Trump is getting 12% of Hispanic vote in Florida. Romney got 40 and we lost. He's getting around 12, 14% nationally. So if what happens with the Hispanics in 2016 and Republicans is the same as what happened with African Americans in 1964, I don't think we'll elect a Republican president for a very, very long time. Well, I agree we're already in the hole exactly for that reason. I wrote a thing for Time back in 2008 I got a bit ridiculed for called the coming Republican Ice Age because you you can't win when you're only playing for 70 percent of the vote. You know, it's like the baseball team that only bats five innings a game. It's just mathematically you're in a hole. And what's interesting about Trump It's like he was designed in a lab to make all the problems we went into this election with even worse, particularly of minority voters and college-educated women. You know, the other big problem, college-educated voters he has. So, Yeah, I give Reince a lot of credit for going through this analysis, so-called autopsy. Some of it I, I didn't particularly agree with, but, you know, just the process of going through that I think is commendable. But and made specific suggestions, made broad suggestions in both the the specific and the broad. Trump is 180 degrees from it. It's like, you know, we decided that chemotherapy probably can work to cure cancer. But instead, we've gone with leeches and people will say, well, we haven't tried leeches yet. Prove to me leeches won't work. It's like, I don't know, dude, I'm not thinking leeches are good here, but you got to go through this process to prove it. I think next step will be Dr. Frank Luntz and the words that work. And you know, then we're bringing the shamans. <laughs> I think the reset now after this thing is going to be both fascinating and terrifying because the parties wanted to have a big primary war. And I talked to the Cruz guys about this on the last episode between kind of the populist and Christian conservative wing and the more regular Republican usual conservative wing. That, that was what was lining up, I think, last time. And then Trump came in, took a bunch of votes from each category and with his pre-war title fame and everything kind of screwed up that fight. So I have a feeling we may be heading for a replay of where we were a year ago in four years. And again, I think it's going to be existential for the party because I think one reform conservative kind of candidate could put the numbers together. And I think if we run a, a base centric candidate like a Cruz, we're going to have the same result. Maybe not quite as catastrophic as Trump, but it won't be good. It won't be accretive. You know, the party has to decide if it wants to be a party that can elect a president. I mean, we can go out and win these governor's races. In 2014, you know, our firm did a bunch of races, won, won tough states like Maryland, Governor Hogan. But in presidential years, can we win the presidency? And your piece in 08, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I, I came across it recently. It's exactly right. We have to appeal to more non-white voters. That's it. I just go back to this. Reagan won a sweeping landslide in 1980 with 57 percent of the white vote. Romney lost with 59 percent of the white vote. And a higher percentage of whites turned out in 2012 than in 1980. It's just math. You can't do it. I joke it's a question of a war between mathematicians and priests because you make that math argument that, again, I think we (laughs) both believe in. On the other side of the equation, the priests say, and this is not to be disrespectful to priests, I was educated by a bunch of them, but the priests say, have faith. Yeah, math is interesting, but if you have faith, it's kind of the crew's missing millions theory. There are these millions of voters who will show up if you're pure. And, you know, I I think this is a question of math, but the party, as you well know, doesn't you know, the incentives are in the primary to win. The general election is some murky thing down the road. And then we argue it all with old analogies to when the electorate was 85, 88 percent white. So it, it just, I don't know how many times we're going to have to learn this lesson. We're in the middle of learning it yet again, but it, it hasn't sunk in. The, the other question, I think, and you touched on it in your answer before, in the off year, we do great because only 88, 89 million people vote. But we get to the on year, it's a whole new electorate up around 128 million, maybe 130 million this year, and we get slaughtered. So yeah, we're the king of the off year, but we just we can't get arrested in the on year, and the party just has to understand that. There's both a, a moral imperative that you represent 
a larger percentage of the, of the country. When more people vote, you want your party to do better, not worse. But whether or not there's a moral argument, there's definitely a political reality. I, I go back to this. Is last time we were able to celebrate as Republicans winning a presidency on election night was 1988. I mean, in 2000, it took us, you know, a month. In 2004, we didn't know till the next day because of Ohio. The difficulty of electing a Republican president is something that most people don't get. You know, this whole idea of 2012 should have been an easy race. This is just all gibberish. It's extraordinarily difficult. And what's happening with Trump is he's shrinking the party. I mean, Romney won white women voters by 14 points. Trump is dead even or losing white women. Yeah, there's a poll out today with him losing college-educated white voters, men and women, which is just, we've never seen that in modern Republican history. you got to run up a huge number there, and he's the opposite. Yeah, and I think by November, yeah, you know, you've done this tons and tons. It's, it's not where we are. It's where we're going to end up. And so you're, you're uh, a Clinton advance person. you, you got a rally you're trying to build. So you talk to headquarters and they say, well, look, do you want the president? Do you want the vice president? Do you want first lady? Do you want Bernie Sanders? Do you want Bill Clinton? Who's going to be out there for Trump? So, you know, as Haley says, good gets better and bad gets worse. And I just don't see what is going to stop this from being just an absolute uh, catastrophe. I think he's in a feedback loop where it gets worse and worse. There are new polls out this morning. It's like Star Wars in the garbage compactor scene when the walls are crushing him down. And you know what happens in a campaign when bad talk is followed by bad polling. The polls all make their own calculation and they run immediately for the tall grass. So Trump was alone to begin with because of the Trump crazy factor. Now Trump's got the anchor around your neck factor. And like in Wisconsin today, we're recording this on Friday, nobody is showing up at his event there. Not Johnson, the senator, not uh, Walker, the governor, and not, of course, Speaker Ryan. It becomes a thing where you're radioactive and people run in the other direction, and that compounds itself. You know, it's like a quicksand. The more you thrash, the deeper it gets. I think the wise thing for the party would be to withdraw support from Trump, for the RNC not to support and do anything for Trump. All this money that's being poured into the Trump campaign is just going down the drain and try to save those that are savable, the Senate and the House. Usually, you know, my experience, like I did well carry. In 1996, we did great till Halloween. And then the pressure of having a dominant top of the ticket in Bill Clinton just forced the ballot down and Weld ended up losing. So if it's bad now, the the centrifugal force of whipping us around by the end of uh, October, I think is just going to be much, much worse. Yeah, it's going to be the 20-foot wall of water, and it's hard to build anything to resist that. I totally agree. They should walk on Trump. I saw some private Mark Kirk dad who's in a very tough race in Illinois for the Senate. He publicly took a walk away from Trump, and it gave him a big bounce. Put him back to the fact where there's still some hope there, although it's an uphill race. I think they totally should walk away because, I mean, we know what the future is going to be. As you say, we're going to pour money down the Trump rat hole. Trump is going to get worse. There's no fixing Trump. You can't fix crazy. And it'll wind up compounding and compounding and turn into a complete fiasco. And then people will run away from him the last 10 days trying to escape the wall of water. Run away from him now. Triangulate. Let people understand, okay, we've got a crazy guy at the top of the party. Stuff happens. At least it's not a Kardashian. But these Republican senators are the counterbalance to Hillary Clinton, who is still a bit of a horror show in her data. And I think we'd have a better chance that way. I think there's this fear, and I'd be curious what you think about it, that some of the polls have, the electeds, that, well, if I come out against Trump, the Trump people will stay home and punish me on Election Day and I won't get that magnificent Trump vote down the ballot. I totally disagree with that. I think Trump has captured the Republican Party, but he doesn't own it. And rank-and-file Republican primary voters are going to pull that our lever for Senate regardless. So I, I think there's so much less risk than they think in walking away from Trump and a lot more in staying with him. I think the message these Senate candidates should have is, look, one of two people is going to be president, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. Let me prove to you why I'm going to be the best senator, regardless of what happens in the presidential race, and uh, go out and make that case. And I, I think independence has never been a stronger quality to have in a candidate. I mean, you did this with McCain in 2000 to the max. You, you sent the template there. 
it seems to me that no one out there is really going to be wanting to make the case for Donald Trump. Therefore, you should make the case for yourself like the congressman uh, is doing in Colorado. Yeah, Kaufman, he's doing a good job yeah. there. He's a good template for other guys in swing districts. I agree, but you get credit for doing it at the front of the train, like now or, frankly, a month ago. If you wait as an elected till late October to say, oh, yeah, I was never for Trump, you get no credit for it, and, you, and it's even worse. So do you think any of these guys will start to get the guts to do it, or it'll just be isolated to a handful? You know, it's just part of this terrible position that, that Trump has placed the party in. My Trumpologist uh, read would be that Trump gets crazier the worse things are and things are going to get worse. So therefore, I think Trump is going to be unhinged. Although I don't know really when you've been out there for a couple of days talking about an imaginary plane in a faraway country that doesn't exist. I don't know how much crazier you can get. But I think that he's going to cross lines where you're going to have to back away from him as a party in the same way that the party backed away from, say, Todd Aiken. So I, I think it's going to happen. I think it'd be better to happen earlier. Personally, I think Speaker Ryan, given the disrespect Trump has shown and other reasons, should step away now before his primary election. He's going to win the primary and then let voters go out and affirm him as someone who is not actively supporting Donald Trump. And I think that would give him great standing going forward. Nothing's more fun in politics than knowing you're going to win an election, so decide what the mandate's going to be a week before. You know, I totally agree. It would be a very slick move by Ryan. But they, it, you know, it just seems to be against every instinct the rank-and-file Republican Paul has. Just stay in the herd, keep going. And then when the real panic breaks out, which is increasing, then they all break, but it's too late to get any credit for it. So I'm, I'm kind of with you. I'm pessimistic that it'll happen. But Trump will get crazier. He's the atomic clock of crazy. Exactly. You, know, you, can, you could calibrate to him. Like Charlie no, Manson right now is uh, sitting in a cell. Huh, yeah. I've got competition here. I've got to up my game a little. <laughs> well, you know, I think that uh, one of the advantages Trump, and he knows it and uses it, is normal people tend to ascribe normalcy to others. It's difficult to imagine crazy if you're not crazy. And I think that that's something that Trump uses. And the inability to imagine how bad Trump is and can be enables him to be as crazy as he is. I mean, I think that certainly happened in the primary. You were much more involved in it than I was. But I think the entire parties, myself included, inability to imagine Trump winning helped Trump win. It's like World War I. You can't really believe this. the whole world is going to go to war over this insanity. And then the next thing you know, you know you're two years in the psalm. No, that's exactly right. I mean, in the primary, everybody was believing history, which is blowhard guys with no ideological standing don't tend to, in the long run, win Republican primaries. That was kind of version one. And the first polling on Trump was pretty bad. This is one of the more interesting things about Trump is – the assumption was as he moved through the primaries, he'd get worse and go down. Instead, the crazier he got, the better he did. The voters got on at least a big hunk of him. The primary got on that crazy train, that grievance train with him. So what we were all thinking, and most of the other managers I think would say this, is, well, we got to consolidate our wing of the party. And then if we get Trump in the finals, we kill him there because there's a ceiling on Trump. And everybody thought, oh, 30 percent. Well, it turned out to be the ceiling was nomination, 44 percent. But everybody was in their short-term view of it. I mean, look, I, I've taken a lot of crap as the guy running the Jeb Super PAC. Why didn't you spend all that money on Trump? Well, because I wasn't really there to elect Ted Cruz the nominee. You know, Trump voters hated Jeb and Jeb voters hated Trump. Our problem were Christie and Kasich and Rubio voters. So the theory was we'd get the natural half of the party that doesn't like Trump and we go to the finals against either Trump or Cruz after we consolidated that. And meanwhile, the Rubio guys were busy trying to kill Chris Christie. Kasich was kind of floating above everybody because nobody took him seriously enough to kill, frankly. And then eventually Cruz figured out that instead of Trump being a placeholder for vote he'd get later, Trump was a huge competition and they started up. So it was one of these 1914 things, to use your analogy, which I agree with, where everybody was doing the smart thing from their interest, but nobody globally was in charge of looking out for the Trump threat. I often say now that if I had a time machine, I would have convened a meeting of all the other super PACs that you know, we could legally communicate and say, OK, guys, let's run an anti-Trump campaign. I'll put down $5 million, and the three of you, Christie, Rubio, Kasich, you know, Walker, if he'd still been in, 
maybe crews if they wanted to participate. You guys put in jointly the other $5 million, and I'm, I'm pretty confident they all would have passed because they all had other things they were thinking about. Again, following their short-term 1914 mobilization plans, not the greater, greater problem. I think had Ted Cruz gone out and said in the very beginning, look, you, you may want to vote for Donald Trump. We're the party that likes people that likes to make money. That's good. We want to affirm that. But he's not a conservative. And don't vote for him thinking that you're voting for a conservative because there's absolutely no way that he is a conservative. And Cruz had that standing to do that. To me, one of the lessons here is that there's a limit to any super PAC's ability to dominate a race when you have these debates and those are the big moments and the candidates have to take on whoever they see as their opponent at the time. And I I think you just can't outsource that. You know, when you have that many candidates and you have such a a jumble stage, it's a perfect storm for a candidate who's willing to say anything, even though it disqualifies them for the general election, which is what Trump did. I agree on the uh, debates being the most powerful thing. And we thought the Cruz guys would do that. And we thought they had the standing to do it, though we would test this stuff. And it was interesting. There was 25 percent of the primary vote that was for Trump, hell or high water. You could call him a Martian. You could call him a Marxist. They would say, yeah, but he, he hates all the right people now. And that's what I care about. I don't care what he did in the past. So one of the first kind of fear waves we had internally watching all this, because, you know, we polled enough to have a good grip on what the primary voters were thinking, was that the normal ideological ray gun didn't seem to work on Trump with up to a third of the vote. And I think the Cruz folks were planning to use that later after drafting him for a while. You know, they talked about this last week on the podcast. And then when it came time to use the ray gun, they found out it didn't work so well. The thing you got to give Trump some credit for is he was able to tap into this huge grievance power that's in the primary now. The Republican Party is corrupt. Washington's corrupt. Obama's a Kenyan socialist. And resonate to that. And the fact that he would say that stuff and get all the Margaret Dumont tisking from the media – and keep going, double down. The raised media eyebrow had no effect on Trump. Historically, it has a big effect on politicians. Only made him more lethal in the primary. Now, it's killing him now because we're in a general election. But in that primary, 40% of that electorate this year, was they were shopping for Trump and they found him. Yeah, and I also think we shouldn't underplay the degree to which Donald Trump made the most blatant appeal to race in a broad sense and bigotry that has been done since George Wallace. When he goes out and talks about a Muslim ban and he's for a Muslim ban, it's really a religious test because how do you know someone's a Muslim if you don't know what they are? You know, my example is like Cat Stevens. Cat Stevens shows up at Heathrow. He wants to come to the United States. And he goes, you know, I'm not a Muslim anymore. I'm a Quaker. Well, what's the guy going to do there, the, the woman standing there at the counter? Ask him, like, trivia questions about William Penn? I'd arrest him for the last few albums, just on general principles, but yeah. I, I talked to Quakers. I have no idea. I come away like, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Nixon was a Quaker. It, raised right. a Quaker. It was a, it's a religious test. And the idea that the United States of America would institute a religious test, just sort of play that out. So we're terrified here of Muslims. So Mexico doesn't have many Muslims, but there are a lot of American Muslims. So maybe Mexico should ban Americans from crossing over to keep this Muslim-American threat from entering Mexico. And I suppose we should import a lot of Mexicans because they're not Muslims. It's just the, the nuttiest sort of idea. The fact is the campaign is drenched in racism. Every villain that Trump rails against has a racial dimension. It's either yes. – and everything is out of like a bad 40s Warner Brothers movie, well, a good Warner Brothers movie in this case. But it's either the badges, no stinking badges, Mexicans are tunneling in to rape and destroy everybody. Or it's the canny Chinese trade negotiators and their Fu Manchu outfits who are wily and outwitting You know the knuckleheads that we have. And I happen to know some American trade negotiators are sharks and the opposite of complete knuckleheads. Or it's Muslims who are always walking around with a bowling ball bomb ready to blow up. So almost everything he does it resonates to a racial stereotype of some kind. And I, I think he's been widely criticized for this, but I don't think enough because that is his secret sauce. And I think the party should call him out more. Yeah, I agree. Um, of all the people who criticized Donald Trump at this uh, Democratic convention, and that was pretty much everybody, as is typical, who's the one that he fixated on? The cons. Why? They're Muslim. Right. 
and they have this otherness. He's obsessed with this sort of, in a way, I really don't even think George Wallace is, is remotely comparable to this, this sort of racial purity. The way he goes after Senator um, from Massachusetts for being Pocahontas. It's just, it's absolutely the most un-American concept that we've really seen. And But, but Trump is un-American in many ways. He's someone who has no familiarity with the Constitution, thinks there's 12 ar- articles in the Constitution. It's just, it's really absolutely uh, astounding. I've got to do the footnote to history, too. That I'm proud of my guy because although we were short on primary voters, Jeb took him on from the beginning, Jeb and Lindsey Graham. And all these other guys were mostly in the witness protection program. Marco's still trying to figure out where he is on Trump. One thing about the Bush campaign is we sleep well at night. I think Jeb would have made a terrific president. And I think were Jeb the nominee, he would be winning. But I tend to think if you were the nominee, you'd be winning. Trump is just about one of the few Republicans who would lose to Hillary Clinton, who his, by any numbers, like you were referencing earlier, is a historically weak candidate. Plus, you have the whole thing of the White House, difficulty of holding the White House for three terms. This should be an easy race to win if there is one. And it looks like it's going to be around. Yeah. No, it is an incredible gift to her. She cannot, I assume, believe it because nobody's played with a weaker hand. And we, as you said earlier, we need to draw from the inside straight to win. So we need an accretive candidate. We need to do a lot more with reform conservatism in the minority vote and get some voters. And we need a flawed Democrat. And so the blueprint was totally there. And uh, it's just not what our primary voters wanted. And, you know, I do, I'm not a big media whiner and I work for NBC. So they have to listen to me in the green room, you know, complain about this. But they are suckers for the show and the pre-aware title and easy conflict. And Trump gave them what they wanted. And Trump did get a ride. He got a lot of noise and attention. And as you well know, this, this early polling that drives so much in a primary of the conventional wisdom is heavily a noise meter based on that week in the news who got the most volume. And Trump was in the tawdriest possible way, but effectively the champion of the noise meter campaign. I think the way to debate Trump, and I think it's the way Hillary Clinton will debate him, is you have to just decide, and it's it's a risky strategy, but you have to decide one of us is going to walk off the stage alive. It might be him, it might be me, but it's not going to be both of us. And I am going to go out and just do everything I can with every minute I have to speak to disqualify Donald Trump. And I think it's ultimately Donald Trump's greatest weakness is his insecurity. And if you ask him, do you support the Bill of Rights? He goes, of course, Bill of Rights are great, great. How many amendments are there? He couldn't tell you. If you ask him, is Turkey in Asia or Europe? He couldn't tell you. He couldn't tell you how a bill gets made. He couldn't tell you how many Supreme Court justices there are. And I think that people don't like to be embarrassed by their candidate. And I think that's part of what's happening now, certainly with these college-educated voters. But, you know, in this last numbers I saw, Trump was doing worse than Romney did with males with high school or less education. Yeah, he, he's doing worse than mid on election day right now with everybody. And look, I agree. If I were a debate negotiator for Hillary Clinton and my brain explodes even thinking about this, I'd rather go sign up with I'll never vote for Trump. But the idea of Hillary still drives me crazy. But if I were them, if I were the Hillary debate people, I'd go with the Patty Chayefsky rule here and I would make my debates I would live or die on one negotiating point, no studio audience other than the town hall debate because you need him in an empty room with two podiums and tough questions and a penetrating television camera. That'll break Trump. He feeds on the energy of rooms and I think if you put him under that televised microscope, what that lens can do – and right, I think grind him and cross-examine him on tough stuff and let him flail and let him appeal to his 35 percent of the vote and box him in there. I think you break him in debates. You know, one thing that potentially is useful about Trump, there have been these nutty ideas about how to win that has been sort of pushed out there by those who think it's in their best interest. I mean, it's just this idea that Republicans could appeal to more white voters, you know, what I call the lost tribes of white voters. Uh, if we just paddle the canoe far enough up the river and bang the drum loudly enough, these lost tribes will come to the riverbank and vote for us. Or if you just yelled at the media enough, 
and, and talked about how corrupt the media was. These were all sort of magic keys to the kingdom. Mostly it's what whoever says that would have liked to have done when they were running for president. And when you lose an election, every theory of how you should win can be true. There's no universe in which that didn't occur. It, it becomes such junk science. So they're going to go out and they're going to try this. So Trump is a perfect candidate for this. But I have to say, like, you know, I am very pessimistic on the party's ability to learn from Trump. Um, might be wrong, but I'm, I'm, I just am not sure if any party is a learning organism now. Look, I, I don't think I'd make that bet either. I do believe, well, let's put it this way. It's a mixed bag at best because you're going to have Trump impersonators come out because monkey see, monkey do. Hell, the Kardashians will probably file. You're going to have the Cruz world, the purity world, come back and say, see, we ran a moderate demagogue, didn't work. Let's be pure. And again, let's paddle up the river and get the missing millions. You're going to have the regulars like us going, the Sepaku party of suicide is insane. <laughs> and, you know, we'll be back. I think it will be a generational change election in 2020. But between now and then, it'll be, my analogy is always China in the 20s, warlord rule. You know, it'll be the dog-faced general and his army versus somebody else. And it'll just grind on. We will have some, quote unquote, wins in the midterm just because we're going to lose so much this time. We have some easy comebacks where Republican districts snap back. But uh, I can't see the party having a big cathartic moment where, oh, I get it. We have to be accretive. It's going to be a long, painful slog. And uh, we could repeat the mistake. Somebody needs to go out there and apologize to a lot of the voters that Trump has offended. You can't call Mexicans rapists. It's like this doctor friend of mine has always voted Republican. You know, he called me up and goes, so look, you know, I work at this big hospital. About 30 percent or so of the people I work with are Latino. So you're like, you're supposed to be good at this. Have you got like talking points of how I'm supposed to explain to him that like Trump didn't mean that all Mexicans were rapists? Just like some? It's like, I don't know, man. I'm not that good. Just because, you know, I don't think I could put a Trump bumper sticker and park in the parking lot here at this hospital. And that's... That's what's happening. I mean, you, you, you just can't go out and throw this uh, racially charged stuff and not expect it to have a stain on not only the candidate but the party once you've accepted that nominee. I think the most important 24 hours of this election are going to be from Trump's concession meltdown or whatever sets his hair on fire, whatever he does, through the next day what Paul Ryan does. And it is a moment because he'll be the titular head of the party at that point unless we hold the Senate, which we could do, but it's a slog and hard. And somebody's got to talk to the country on, on the restart. And he's got the standing to do it. And I hope they're thinking about that because there's going to be a window from nanosecond one after they pulled Trump's politically dead body off the uh, stage for somebody to take that moment. And Ryan's the right guy if he can think that big. Uh, he's in a very difficult position. I can't imagine what it's like to you know, have the multiple responsibilities he has. But I think he would be best served and the party would be best served if he did step away from Trump before his election and got affirmation. No, I agree. Again, he's, got, he's going to win so he can come out for anything, and that's the right thing to be for. Well, let's do one big Trump mega question here. I have been pushing the theory – And it's been lost a little in the details, which are important, that it is unlikely but not impossible that after a few weeks of horrible polls and being America's biggest loser and anathema to his brand, that pouty Trump will just say, all right, screw you people. You're out to get me in the Republican Party. You subverted my campaign. I'm out. I quit. Now, people roll their eyes. Oh, that's impossible. Nominees never quit. But we've never had a crazy nominee before. And he is a creature of his ego. And I don't think he likes being America's biggest loser, which is what all the polls are going to be barking here for a while. Do you think there's any chance of that? Or am I nuts and it's zero? I'm even nuttier because, you know, I wrote a piece for the Daily Beast. I wrote it partly to be provocative, but there was enough in it that I actually believed. I was convinced that Trump would lose Iowa, just having slogged through Iowa so many times. And it just seemed so weird that Iowa would vote for a guy who's been married three times, you know, casino owner, that those Republican electorates would, would vote for him. So I wrote this piece of the Daily Beast back in the fall saying I thought Trump would get out before Iowa because it was going to be clear he'd lose Iowa. The greatest sin in his world is to be a loser. And I was half right. He lost Iowa. And then to my astonishment, when he was weak there, sort of the pack didn't, didn't descend on him. 
I don't know. Trump is surrounded by a group of people in his organization, his core organization, who are mainly hired out of their loyalty to Trump. These are people who could never have a like position otherwise. So they're desperately loyal to Trump because Trump has elevated them to a statue they could never have in the real world. I tell you, Tony Soprano puts together a gang. You get these guys, you know that your only hope is, you know, if Tony lives. And the campaign, I don't know who's a peer there who can tell him this. I have no idea. He's just, you know, existed in this bubble where it's, yes, Mr. Trump, you know, with these sad characters like Corey Lewandowski and this Katrina Pearson. I mean, these people, this, these broken toys of politics that I, I don't, I, I just don't know. Yeah, I agree with that. It's basically a campaign of advanced people and get Mr. Trump his meatloaf, get Mr. Trump his podium. And I think Trump creates that culture because he doesn't want advice. It's like the old joke about sending the ambassador to the cannibal king. A week later, you get a femur back with the note, send another ambassador. The last one was delicious. Trump advice giver, I don't think exists because he operates purely on instinct. And what he's thinking in his egomaniacal way is, hey, my instincts worked before. I don't need any of this. I got nominated. Nobody said I could. Get me a rally in a safe Republican congressional district and I'll feed off the crowd and there would be some yelling and then I can watch coverage of the rally on my plane driving back. So I think that's the Trump feedback loop. And he doesn't know the primary's over. I mean, he, and he, I don't think he values any advice to explain that to him. So he'll just slash away until the great forces of politics crush him like that Star Wars uh, garbage disposal. The analogy I often use with Trump is he's someone who's jumped off a 100-story building as a floor 50 and thinks he's learned how to fly. Right, right, exactly. Like, this is great, man. All you people yeah. didn't think it was going to do it. And you go, I don't know, dude. I'm a bird. I don't think this is going to work out so well. People ask me this all the time, and I want to say zero, but it's not the year to say zero. What do you think the realistic odds that Trump could actually win are, and is there any path forward? I say 10 percent, and I don't have a path. I would say 20, 25 percent. I think Nate Silver's numbers are pretty good on that. I was trying to reassure someone uh, as I was driving to the airport that Trump wouldn't win. So what do you think? I said 20, 25 percent chance. They said, well, would you get on that plane you're driving to if it had 20 percent chance of crashing? I was like, no, it's a good point. I think I'd drive. So as, as someone noted, maybe Silver, 20% is how often NBA players miss free throws. And they miss free throws. So the worst of this is Trump has made all the wrong people right. You know, he is proving every every negative stereotype about the Republican Party. And I think, honestly, Republicans have to ask ourselves the ability for this to resonate to the degree that he could get the nomination. What does this mean? I don't think we can just dismiss it as this strange, bizarre thing that has happened as if an alien landed and mystified people. It says something about the Republican Party, and I think it says something very negative about the Republican Party. But I don't think that uh, there's really a realistic path for him to win. You've got the Republican Party is about 10 points lower than the Democratic Party on the generic. So that's going to push him down, not up. Uh, He has no campaign. They don't even have a rapid response website. I mean, if you went in and you were just hired to look at this campaign as a congressional campaign, you'd go like, guys, some things you need to do here. Get a rapid response staff. Get a website up. And it's hard. It's a really bad congressional campaign just yes. with a famous lunatic running it. The reason I'm at 10 is I'm on the bell curve theory. If it was a pure resentment campaign harnessing what's going on in the country, I'd say 40, 45 percent. Maybe you can bend the math and do it. But it's either going to be that which is the best version of a Trump campaign, or it's going to crumple into madness with Trump throwing meatloaf plates at people and scurrying around and the plane going in circles. And I think that's kind of where we are now. So if that continues, I do the bell curve and put him down at 10. But, you know, maybe it can change. There are 90 days or so. I don't don't really think, I think think it's not going to change. Look, Trump is on his message. His message is just this grievance monger that he's out there. And look, one of the negative things here people really haven't focused on is if this does come around to issues, Trump is way to the left on tr- his, his job plan is his trade plan. And he's basically running against every Republican. So he's going to have to go out there. And the only way you get any of this stuff passed is if there was a, really more of a left Democratic Senate than it is now. He's to the left of Bernie Sanders on trade. No, he totally is. He is without ideology. And when you pin him down, the populism is uh, is lefty as hell. He's Mussolini, frankly. 
Now, here's a question. Have you ever met Trump? Yes. I dealt with him some in 2012. You know, people forget he was going to moderate a debate over Christmas in 2011, in the 2012 campaign, uh, two days after Christmas for Newsmax. And we had to kill that. And what was fascinating about that whole process was, you know, he kept saying, well, you know, we'll get great numbers, which might have been true. It would have been interesting to watch with Donald Trump moderating a debate. (laughs) But it was like, you know, we don't need name ID. We don't have a name ID problem. We don't need just gross numbers. It was sort of like, you know, we're campaigns at a certain point get more like movie stars where you're about getting good press, not just any press. And it was just sort of a, a strange concept to him. And then, of course, you know, he thought that after he endorsed Mitt, which perhaps naively to a certain degree, we saw it before in the Nevada primary. He's a guy who had business in Nevada, actually did well on surveys that showed people like to work for him. I mean, we did four or five of these a day, get him to endorse, fine, whatever. But then he thought he'd go on the plane with Mitt. And it was like, no, they're not going to go on the plane and campaign with Mitt Romney. And he was like, but I've, I can make this time. It was like, thanks very much, but no. Then he thought, of course, you know, it was just a question of which night he would speak at the convention. Yeah. I was like, no, that's not going to happen either. Did you actually have a conversation with him? Did you have to explain uh, I, some I, of this I've, to I've had I've had a few, all very nice. <laughs> and you know what's interesting about 2012 is even though he was being told no on these things, he never went crazy. He never went out and attacked uh, Mitt. I don't know what he thought personally. You know how much to the degree he was he was steaming, but I would give him credit for uh, being more restrained then. And I just wonder if this process has really he has changed the process. Yes. But I wonder if the process has also changed him. Oh, I think so. It's underwritten every bad instinct he has. He's caught right. in his own act now. And the act has become the reality. I knew Ann Coulter before she was crazy. She was kind of a normal, smart young lawyer working on Senator Spence Abraham's staff. And then I think she turned into this television creature and the television creature took three quarters of her head right. over. I met Trump once in a kind of a micro way. I was just walking through the uh, – Oh, this sounds like a horrible Hollywood story, but I was walking through the Beverly Hills Hotel a few years ago, and there was Trump kind of standing around pouting, waiting for some PR person to usher him somewhere. And he looked at me, and he vaguely recognized me, but I don't think he knew who I was. I just looked familiar, and he couldn't decide if I were somebody he knew or some creditor he'd stiffed on a cement contract (laughs) somewhere. And hey, I, and he kind of like looked over and did this weird wave smile, doesn't want to shake hands, saying, hey, how are you? And I, I kind of kept moving. He was standing there wanting to be attended. There was some event going on at the hotel as well. I was just going to meet some friends for a drink. And uh, I looked at him. I thought, it's a little crazy in the eyes there. I'd never been a Trump fan. I read that uh, O'Donnell book, Trumped, years ago about his casino days. And then when I was working for Christine Todd Whitman, the governor of New Jersey, we had some rough dealings with him because he thought the state should build an expressway right to his casino. But I'd never really dealt with him. That was the only time I was kind of in his physical space. And he's just a weird dude. Yeah, he is somebody, if you, if you just you know, knew him, you think, this is an odd guy. You might like him, might kind of enjoy him some, you know. I mean, I have a lot of odd friends, and probably I have a lot of friends who think I'm odd. But, you know, they're not running for president, and I'm not running for president. <laughs> There's yeah, a reason yeah, they, for we that. don't give them the nuclear football. <laughs> no. So your other life, let's talk a bit. You have a novel out. I do, yeah. Tell me about it. You know, it's called uh, The Innocent of Nothing to Fear. Knopf published it in June. It's something I really started before the Romney campaign. Uh, it's set at a Republican convention in the near future, and it's in New Orleans, because I think all conventions should be held in New Orleans, Democrat and Republican, every year. It's really about two candidates. One is, as it turns out, a very Trump-like figure. He's a governor of Colorado, but very populist, uh, who wants to rewrite the Bill of Rights, anti-immigration, sort of these draconian policies. And the title comes from, you know, whenever he's asked, do you think you're going too far? He always sort of says with this wry smile, well, the innocent have nothing to fear. And he's running against a a sitting vice president who's Republican who is sort of uh, sane. And it's narrated by a guy who is running her campaign, and and he's from New Orleans, and he hates the fact that the campaign is back in New Orleans. You know, I wanted to write this. It's a dark comic novel with the idea to sort of push what could happen out there. I posited the race after a economic crash because I naively thought it would take a deep economic crash to create someone like the character that I wrote. 
As it turns out, I was wrong. We had Donald <laughs> Trump without it at economic crash. But I thought it was sort of a Swiftian way to look at what could happen. You've observed this, the, the sort of forgetting Trump, the sort of subterranean plates of our politics have been apparent how they were shifting around and how they could create this. And now it's just happened. Yeah. Life imitates art. It sounds pretty timely. We will add it to the soon-to-be-established Radio Free GOP book club as an official selection, (laughs) which means we sell exactly two and a half copies. You'll still get a note from my mother. Thank you. (laughs) Stuart, I want to thank you for doing this. Do you have a Twitter handle or a way people can follow you on the interweb? I do have a Twitter handle. It's just Stuart P. Stevens. Unfortunately, I do tweet now. You know, I didn't tweet during the 2012 campaign and afterwards the Times wrote this piece and it shows how far out of touch Romney was with social media and if only Stuart Stevens had tweeted. I think I've proven maybe Romney would have done better. I think I've cleared that myth up. I mean, I think had I been tweeting in 2012, I'm absolutely confident we would have lost Utah. Um, but I'm well, out there now. Yeah, I tweet irresponsibly too. You know, the problem with all us old guys in politics is it is assumed we're not technological. I mean, I built my first computer with a soldering iron. And I used to carry around when Castellanos and I were younger and in our partnership, we thought we were so cool because we carried K-Pro portable computers around, which were about as big as a sewing machine. So uh, it, just because just we're old doesn't mean we don't dig technology. Stuart, thanks a lot for doing the podcast. Listen, Mike, great fun, man. Good to connect. It's number one for rumors and fun. It's Resistance Podcasting Radio Free GOP. Well, that's our podcast. Thank you for clicking and listening. Thank you for the good emails and the good comments on iTunes. Keep them coming. They really help us get the podcast spread around. Tell your friends. And if you want to keep track of us on Twitter, we're at Radio Free GOP. We're going to have an email listserv pretty soon. You can kind of sign up on our website, RadioFreeGOP.com. I'm on Twitter, at Murphy Mike. And again, I want to thank the Private Equity Fundcast, available on iTunes or Google Play, our first big sponsor, as well as the folks at Ricochet.com. Oh, there's the noise. The thought police are moving in. I have to admit, every week, they move a little slower. The shame is slowing them down, but they're doing their jobs, and we still have to escape to a new undisclosed location. But this time, wonder of wonders, Stuart Stevens is on the run with us in the anti-Trump resistance. Why? Because we both believe in the Republican cause. The days of Trump will pass, and in the end, victory will be ours. Thanks for listening. This has been Radio Free GOP, the voice of the Republican resistance, with your host, Mike Murphy.